Call Haloyim Yahweh Bashim Yahweh Shai Bashim Rakakadash, double honor to the apostles and others of great millstone who rule all over the flock. Shalom, my salutation, brothers out here, push the words of truth and sincerity. Shalom to the Akim and the Akwaf listening and paying attention. Scatter the Israelites. We the 12 tribes of Israel. Our people is casted away. And now we're coming back. Those dry bones are having flesh being brought upon them through the spirit of prophecy, uh, which goes out like the wind. And so now you can understand that your people are coming from a perspective. You Negroes, Latinos, and Native Americans, so-called, are coming from a, 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 a people who used to be uh, more valiant, more noble, more uh, um, uh, resilient, more honorable than you were in our. We were in our past, and because we sinned against our power, Yahweh, uh, he said he saw it so to completely destroy us. So this time is allotted. For the time of his, uh, the believers, the true believers, to return back to the Lord in truth, as the scripture said, and worship him in truth. All right, in which you get wisdom, understanding from men who the Lord gives wisdom and understanding to, right? He anoints us with this uh, oil. Now, this I came across, it says, don't forget to drink water so you can stay hydrated while you suffer. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny, man. You know, it's like dark humor. I got, I got a sense of humor. And so I enjoy, you know, I enjoy it all. Dry humor, dark humor, stupid humor, somebody uh, falling off a bike. <laughs> it's all funny. It's all hilarious, right? I mean, but this one right here, don't forget to drink water so you can stay hydrated while you suffer. All right. This sounds like a term. It reminded me instantly of Ecclesiastes, the first chapter. And I got it in the NLT here. We all know it. And I want you to always be, um, you're always welcome to go into um, the NLT just like you're welcome to go into the King James. And But I'm going into the NLT because I love how they phrase certain things and I fact check it. I always compare and contrast to the KJV. All right. But check how it says in the NLT so it can give you just a different perspective of, of the words you've been reading in the KJV. Ecclesiastes 1 and 2. Everything is meaningless. And what's the word that they use here in the NL in the KJV is right here. You can see it, vanity. <laughs> All right. So what do you do in your mind? It starts to put these two words together. Put meaningless next to vanity. And if you want to go, which you always should, go into the interlinear because the, it was translated into uh, vanity by uh, King James's council who put together the 1611. All right. But in the Hebrew, which is the original tongue, it still means vapor. It actually means vapor breath. Vapor breath, right? It means to breathe, vapor breath. So when you say that Hebrew word, habal, habal to a uh, so-called so Yiddish man. Strong's H, 1892. Hevel. Hevel. That's how they pronounce it in the Yiddish. A little different than how we do. They'll probably tell you it means vapor or breath, but they'll also know if it had, if they know anything, they'll know that it has a figurative meaning of vanity. See vapor, vanity, emptiness, vanity, uh, meaningless, a breath, because a breath just comes and it goes. Something transitory, unsatisfactory. Now you wouldn't go ahead and say a breath is unsatisfactory unless you've seen it in a, phys in a, a, a figurative language. Figuratively, a breath is uh, uh, transitory because it's here and gone. It's just, it's meaningless. It's just a breath. It means a lot to us. We're breathing, but it was just a breath, meaning that last, that breath you took in the third grade doesn't mean anything now. It's unsatisfactory. It doesn't help or heal you, so forth and so on. So when you go into these interlinear, you can kind of compare, contrast the words, the different Bibles, the words. This is just an extra tool to help. You know, you put everything into the proper perspective. So it means breath, right? But it's figurative for vanity. It says often used as an adverb. Okay, so vain, vanity, but it all comes from vapor and breath. And let's get back into what the scriptures say now. And we can see now why meaningless is a very good word for vanity or a synonym. And why the NLT people who put that together took it from vapor, took it from, took what they saw from vapor, took what they saw from vanity, took what they saw from transitory and meaningless, uh, uh, unsatisfactory, and have meaningless now. So let's just continue on. 
<clears throat> that was just a, uh, a a concise little thing of why I still go into the NLT. Ecclesiastes 1 and 2 in the Bible. Everything is meaningless, says the teacher. Completely meaningless. Let these words just resonate because I'm going to read straight down. What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets, then hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south and then turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. Then the water returns again to the rivers and flows out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. History merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. Sometimes people say, here's something new. But actually, it is old. Nothing is ever truly new. We don't remember what happened in the past. And in future generations, no one will remember what we are doing now. And I want you to see that it also captions this whole, what I just read as everything is meaningless. This part says the teacher speaks the futility of wisdom. Futility means pointlessness or uselessness. Always remember this. All right, pointlessness and uselessness. Verse 12, I, the teacher, was king of Israel, and I lived in Jerusalem. I devoted myself to search for understanding and to explore by wisdom everything being done under heaven. I soon discovered that God, Yahweh, has dealt a tragic existence to the human race. That's a deep, that's a deep um, conclusion. It says, I observed everything going on under the sun, and really, it is all meaningless, like chasing the wind. What is wrong cannot be made right. What is missing cannot be recovered. I said to myself, look, I am wiser than any of the kings who ruled in Jerusalem before me. I have greater wisdom and knowledge than any of them. So I set out to learn everything from wisdom to madness and folly. But I learned firsthand that pursuing all this is like chasing the wind. The greater my wisdom, the greater my grief. To increase knowledge only increases sorrow. Woo! From the words of King Solomon, translated from the KJV in the Old Testament. I mean, the uh, Hebrew into the NLT. Powerful words, man. When you just sit back and just meditate on those words, pause the video and just come. You can go a whole day just meditating on that mindset of the wisest king of Israel. You can go a whole year just meditating on that. And what it will happen is it gives the impression that King Solomon was what we call today nihilistic. 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 Which means rejecting all religious and moral principles in the belief that life is meaningless. Now, hold on. Was he completely nihilistic? I don't think so. I don't think King Solomon at all was rejecting his religious or moral principles. But he did have a belief that life is meaningless. He was partially nihilistic. And it has some images here in which kind of help uh, describe with the nihilistic life never matters you know these people they down and about you got your optimistic pessimistic the nihilistic is nothing there's no cup he don't believe that there's a cup at all it's not even worth mentioning the cup so in this it's ecclesiastes the first chapter you it's safe to say that king james is coming on that nihilistic which you would consider depressed because if somebody comes up to you and tells you straight up, hey, man, life is meaningless. Everything in, mean in life is just meaningless. It's empty. It's You'll never be satisfied. People today combat that. They don't even allow themselves to get the wisdom in which King, J King Solomon is describing life. There's wisdom in these words when you embrace it. You don't have to reject that. This is not a scary scripture. Embrace it. 
Because in the end, King James, it doesn't necessarily sound like that anymore. Now, this is the NLT of Ecclesiastes 12. Once again, we read the KJV up and down, especially at camp. We want you first need to get acclimated to the KJV before any other because it is the closest to right. But there are some there are some high benefits in going into right as I just described. So Ecclesiastes twelve and one, don't let the excitement of your youth cause you to forget your Creator. Well, hold on, I thought life was meaningless, King James, King Solomon. It still is meaningless. However, you don't reject, as the true form of nihilist says, rejecting all religious and moral principles. We're not true nihilistics. We're not true nihilists. Because we will not reject all moral principles and religion. We don't reject that. Neither did King Solomon. Don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your creator. He's still religious. Because truism is... Honoring the Father. The beginning of all wisdom is the fear of the Lord. It says, honor him in your youth before you grow old and say life is not pleasant anymore. Right? And once again, you just click on a few buttons and you got the KJV right there. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not. Nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say I have no pleasure in them. What this is going into is a twofold thing. He's also speaking about a general life from a man's existence from beginning to end. Because we just read how in Ecclesiastes 1, he's dealing with the, the worthlessness of your existence from beginning to end. You don't remember anything from your past life. Uh, you work all the time. The wind blows. The sun goes up and comes down. He devoted his life. So he's talking about one lifetime. But... Things are metaphors in the scriptures, man. There was always a deeper connection between that one lifetime of one man. You can look at it that way and it made sense in that way. But it was a metaphor for all actually in the these times we're living in now. When things will heighten, our senses will be heightened, prophecies will be revealed, men would be more in tune to, you know, a we would be attached to the looking and seeking for wisdom. So he said, honor him in your youth before you grow old and say life is not pleasant anymore. Now, once again, he's speaking about one individual life. But we also know that in the days of our youth is when we first come into this truth. And when you have no more pleasure in them because evil is still coming. Remember, it says before the evil days come not in the KJV. So you can't just run with NLT all the time. How about that? Vice versa. Right? You got to have discernment with the KJV in order to even go into the NLT. Otherwise, you get, you know. But remember this, he's talking about um, a man's life from beginning to end. Now, he emphasizes certain points, but they're metaphors. Remember him before the light of the sun, moon, and stars is dim to your old eyes. So he's still talking about old age in general. But he's using a man's old age to reference the times ahead. It says, in rain clouds continually darken your sky. Because you got these old eyes and you've been here for a long time on this earth. You got to remember the Lord before you get to that old age. Remember, you started out as a youth. Don't forget him. Don't try to remember him when it's too late, when you're all old now. In your old age. The scripture where Yahweh Shah says, uh, oh, you know, you can't put new wine in old bottles. Um, seeking that, you know, seeking the Lord while you're in your youth. You know, turning back to the Lord and seeking the Lord is a young man's, it's the glory in it is why you're young, doing it while you're young. So you can have this wisdom for the rest of those years that you live on. It says, remember him. Now check this out. And the KJV doesn't do this for you, but we still know it's talking about a man, right? It says, remember him before your legs. It says the God is in your house. Start to tremble. And before your shoulders. The strong men stoop. Remember him before your teeth. 
your few remaining servants stop grinding. Remember, and before your eyes, the women looking through the windows, see dimly. It's giving you metaphors. Now, this is nothing new to Jake. This is this is nothing new to Jake. Remember, the KJV just says in the days when the keepers of the house shall tremble. We understand this, meaning where the keepers of the house deals with the elites. They're, they're coming to a point where they're going to be in fear, in total fear of the Lord. And their fear is going to crumble with the society that they control. And the strong men shall bow themselves. All the elites and the leaders of this world are going to bow themselves and fall. Because the Lord said, you know, he that is um, high, high, hearty, you know, the hearty shall fall and I will cause them to fall. And the grinders of this shall cease, right? Now, grinders, one, we understand it's, it's spiritual. Spiritually, grinders is the men that work. That means your jobs is going to dwindle. In this time we're in. There's going to be a time when high, high unemployment. You've had that in our community, so-called Negro community in America for years. We have always had the higher unemployment rate. But there's going to be a severe high unemployment rate. But what's also a grinder, right? You know, it says here, a machine used for grinding something. But your teeth is also a grinder. You see how it's still dealing with the body. Of an old man. It's still giving you an analogy of an, of, a, of an old man. But being twofold. And the grind is ceased because they are few. And what happens when you get older? Your teeth go missing. And those that look out of the windows are darkened. What's you looking out of? A window. Your, your eyes are your windows. It just said in the verse above that the stars is dim to your old eyes. Remember him before then. And the KJV... It emphasizes the same point. While the sun or light or moon or the stars be not darkened. Nor the clouds return after the rain. The, the, the uh, metaphor is of an old man. But it's metaphorically using an old man to refer to other things that are happening in the late time of society. In the end times. The old man is the end times. Remember him before your teeth, your few remaining servants stop grinding. In the end times, the, the people are not going to be able to continue to. The few remaining as the elite, as the system corrodes and corrupts. People flee, people leave, people abort. You just had a so-called transgender top man in U.S. military got caught for trading secrets to Russia. They're, they are breaking apart. Even Esau's system is breaking apart before our eyes. Whistleblowing and whatnot. But also that emphasizes the jobs. The grind of the job of your daily work. And before your eyes, the women looking through the window see dimly. So this is all a parable. Now watch this. This has been done before. Nothing new under the sun. It started with what, what, what he, King Solomon did in Ecclesiastes 12. You go to a song by Lupe Fiasco called Daydreaming from his first album. He did the same thing. One of my favorite songs ever. And I remember when I first heard this metaphor, I didn't understand it. He's describing something metaphorical too. He says, as I spy from behind my giant robot eyes, I keep him happy because I might fall out if he cries. Scared of heights, so I might pass out if he flies. Bear with me. Keep on him on autopilot because I can't drive. Room enough for one. I tell my homies they can't ride unless they sitting on the shoulders, but that's way too high. Let's try not to step on the news cameras filming the walking, this walking project building. He's talking about a, a robot that's a metaphor for a project building. The robot he's guiding is really a project building complete with drugs, money, corruption, and all other ills of the hood. And it represents the city of Chicago where Lupe grew up. Since he lives here and can't get away from it, he pretends daydreams that the building is really a robot. The following lines describe what the robot looks like. It's a long metaphor that takes up most of the first verse. It's all a metaphor for the projects. 
He says, now they hole selling holes. Now there's hole selling holes like right around the toes. And the crackhead's bag at about the lower leg. There's crooked police that's stationed at the knees. And they do drive-bys like up and down the thighs. There's a car chase going on at the waist. Keep a vest on my chest. I'm sitting in my room as I'm looking at out the face. Something to write about. I still got some damage from fighting the White House. He just described the body of the robot. Lupe describes what is what his robot really is. A physical manifestation of the issues plaguing the ghetto. Notice how the arrangement of these people represent the social hierarchy. The prostitutes are at the bottom. The crackheads are just a little bit above them. And the police are above both. This he's describing it. Toes, lower leg, knees, waist, uh, thighs, waist. He's going from the bottom to the top. Then chest. Then he stops with the eyes. From the bottom to the top. It makes sense now. Try not to step on the children. <laughs> Walking project building. Hoes, crackheads, crooked police, drive-bys, car chases. And so, you know, you get excited when you read the scriptures and you get a a deeper understanding of because you see how connected and then you can embrace the metaphor a new way because the metaphor is all throughout the scriptures man the lord said it is not given unto them to understand but it was given unto you many men and prophets have desired to understand the things that you do and have and, and did not get that understanding it goes on to say, remember him, verse 4, remember him before the door to life's opportunities is closed. This is all a parable working off of the image of a man who's young and then he turns old. But it's not surface level. It's metaphorical. There's something deeper than, than just he's talking about when you get old. Remember him before the doors of life's opportunity close and the sound of work fades. The grinding shall cease. Now you rise up in the first chirping at the first chirping of the birds, but then all their sounds will grow faint. You can't hear no more as you get older. Right? This word, you can't hear the word anymore as you start to age and you missed out on that opportunity to learn this while you was young. You can't put new wine in old bottles. Many men desire to know what you know, but they can't. And a lot of that has to do with the most uh, really not accepting them. They're not a part of the elect. They wasn't called. Many are called, but few are chosen. Not everybody's called. But to understand these things of a man who missed out on these opportunities as a youth and now the creator forgets him because he forgot the creator since he was a youth. But then all their sounds grow faint. He can't hear the words of the Lord. He can't take pleasure in this word that we do. This is food for us. We eat this up. That man cannot take pleasure in it. Remember him before you become fearful of falling and worry about danger in the streets. You understand? The fearful of falling, how an old man fears to fall. And how an old man worries what kind of danger is in the street. Do you understand in these days, these evil times we're in right now, <clears throat> men are going to be afraid whether young or old they're going to be afraid the scripture says men's heart shall fail them they should be in travail as a woman this shall be like a time like no other time before nothing to be compared to it the time of jacob's trouble but the, the elect shall be saved out of it the remnant shall be delivered out of it those that believe that remember the creator when you written in the book of life the apostle around love just did a video on the book of life once you're signed in the book of life and sailed in there those are the men and the women and the children that believed on the Lord. And the Lord puts them in a in a parabolic book that he remembers them. And they'll be remembered in these times, in these end times. Remember, because the prophecy, the parable is, the metaphor is the old man res resembles the end times. Before your hair turns white like an almond tree in the bloom and you drag along with without energy like a dying grasshopper and the cap berry no longer inspires sexual desire older men don't want to have sex no more they can't there's the, the desire look at the pair look at the situation with king uh david upon his deathbed they brought him a young maiden his wife brought him a different woman why his wife because she wasn't proud she knew that her body 
as old as she was, is not going to inspire a sexual desire in him and keep him alive because he was on his deathbed. So she brought him a young maid to give him heat, the scriptures say, so that he could be sexually aroused. Where they do that at? What mindset should you got to be as a loyal wife and yet in the end of your life to been with your husband to try to, to give him a young girl at the end of his life just to keep him alive? You know what they're going to say? Well, he was a king. I ain't got to do that for you. I digress. And the Kappa Berry no longer inspires sexual desire. Drag along with no energy. You ain't gonna have no energy in this in this in these times we in. If you ain't got this wisdom, knowledge, or understanding, if the Lord ain't fighting for you, you ain't gonna have no energy to fight off all of these adversarial demons, plagues, pestilences, and fight in the Lord fight for you and guide you through. You're not gonna see a way out. The let gonna always see a way out because the Lord gonna provide it for them and He's gonna inspire them to have that understanding. This is your way out. Go that way. Go this way. Talk to this man. Deal with this person. Go that way. Stop doing that. Don't go in there. The Lord's going to alert us. We're going to get spiritual alerts as we do now. Hair turns white. You know, it's all metaphor for the end times and getting this wisdom now in the, your youth. Remember him before you near the grave, your everlasting home. Woo! When the mourners will weep at your funeral. Yes, remember your creator now while you are young before the silver cord of life snaps and the golden bowl is broken. Don't wait until the water jar is smashed at the, at the spring and the pulley is broken at the well. Mm. Mm -mm. I mean, come on. Let's see. Let's see. Now I want to go bring y'all into how I normally. Let's see if I could grab this. Let's see. BLB. I mean, uh, I believe that's 12, is it? Let's see if I can grab this in Bible Hub real quick because this is getting real good. This is real edifying. And, you know, in Bible Hub, they got some down at the bottom. If y'all know. If you know, you know. Commentaries. This is men that also took time out to, to study the scriptures and compare and contrast. And they have some good commentary sometimes. Verse 6 says, <clears throat> the words will call us to verses 1 and 2. Bidding the youth. Bidding means uh, uh, begging, basically. The youth to make the best use of his time ere old age cuts him off. Ere meaning before. cut. Old age cuts you off. Old age is a cut off point, man. As you get older, there's a cutoff to your inspiration. There's a cutoff to your desire to go run and play. There's a cutoff to your desire to learn. There's a cutoff. We're all headed towards that cutoff. I don't care how young you are. You are headed towards the cutoff called old age that snatches everybody up. And the king who is at that has passed that age himself and given all this wisdom. It's telling you how meaningless this life is. So don't waste your youth thinking that you'll have it forever. You got to talk to people in their older age so you can see how wiser they are than the youth. Even in the world, the older are more wiser than the younger. Even in the truth, the older are wiser than the younger. But there's a point in which things start to adjust and you can't continue to do what you was doing before. There is a cut off point. In the present paragraph, the final dissolution is described under two figures. The silver cord be loosed or the golden bowl be broken. This is evidently one figure which would be made plainer by reading and instead of or. The idea being that the lamp is shattered by the snapping of the cord that suspended it from the roof. But there are some difficulties in closer explanation of the allegory of the bowl. Gulla is a reservoir of oil in a lamp. He even has the precepts for you to read them. Zechariah 4 and 3, 4. Which supplies nourishment to the flame. When this is broken or damaged so as to be useless, the light, of course, is extinguished. The Septuagint calls it, that's the Greek, 
The Vulgate calls it, that's the Latin, the golden fillet. Or flower ornament on a column which quite sinks the notion of a light being quenched. Let's see if I can get a image of the golden fillet. Because we don't use lamps anymore. Now you got to go back in time. Now you got to go back in time to see how a lamp was used. I can't even get a good damn fillet. Gave me a fillet fish. I can't even. I can't. I can't with these people. Gave me a fillet fish. <laughs> oh, man. Let's see if I got an image of nothing, man. Nothing. Nothing. I'm just looking for a lamp. Let me type in lamp. Because there's going to be an image of a lamp that, mm, of an old school lamp that takes oil. Let me just type in oil lamp. Ah, oh, man. Okay. Well, I'm getting a little better now. As you can see, oil is needed and everything is needed for these oil lamps to continue. It has to, the oil has to be fed through an area, right? Look at these things. You could literally have a start a candle with just using oil with a wick. So going back to what he's bringing out, the Septuagint calls it the the Vulgate bitter or flower ornament on a column, which is quite, which quite sinks the notion of a light being quenched. A cord, the cord is that by which the lamp is hung in a tent or a room. So imagine a cord hanging this oil lamp, hanging this lamp, a cord hanging it. But of what in man are these symbols? Many fanciful interpretations have been given. The silver cord is the spine, the nerves generally, the tongue, the golden bowl is the head. See, people understand that King Solomon is making a reference. He's using a metaphor of a man to symbolize the end times. That's what we understand. I don't know if all of these commentators understood that. But it's also meaningful that you get this wisdom while you're young. It's making, it's almost a double, triple entendres head. Is the head the membrane of the brain, the stomach? But these anatomical details are not to be adopted. They have little to recommend them. And in Kurt Kruger. So they're just brainstorming what he meant by that here. Yeah, they brain, they're doing a lot of brainstorming. See, these things... The reason why you have a commentary on this that is this long is because these things inspired men to scratch their head, which goes back into the scripture. This goes back into what the Lord said. <clears throat> Let's go back and what the Lord said. Mm. Okay, wasn't given to them. Yeah, Matthew 13. And I'm going to go up a little bit. Yeah, let's read the context. Matthew 13, context. And 11, starting at 8. But the other fellow unto good ground and uh, brought forth fruit. So this is the parable of the sower. Let's jump to 10. Let's jump to 9. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Which is dark sayings, hard, a simple story used to illustrate a moral or spiritual lesson. The Lord himself was using metaphors, parables. It's all throughout the scriptures. This wisdom is a mystery. Brothers in G, uh, Birmingham always bring it out. It's a mystery. It's mystery. Meaning it's not for everybody to get. That's why the Lord was doing that. I want you to know it, not them. Look at mystery. Something that is difficult or impossible to understand or explain. See, the elect going to get it. We're giving these explanations, but everybody's not going to get it. The elect is a puzzle, an enigma, a conundrum. <laughs> conundrum. 
a confusing and difficult problem or question. That's what the Lord is throwing out there. He's talking about men not believing in the word and not being ex uh, for wisdom dropping into good ground is is a is a is a parable of a man who the Lord wants this seed of knowledge to grow in as opposed to a man who is like unto stony ground and the seed of knowledge is not going to grow into everybody's not built equal there's levels to this you can't force the ground that is hardened and is in the uh i forget the word the expression that they use um the way path meaning the beaten path meaning the walk path if you're stepping on the land all the time you can't get it to grow it's not it's, it needs to be broken up the scriptures talk about breaking up your fallow ground your mind needs to be broken this lord said he wants it broken in the contrary spirit that's like in the two that soil that gets broken up before you plant the seed you gotta tear that you gotta toil in that soil man you swaying man just to drop one seed in there and the Lord is using that parable and just throwing it out there. And very few men was like, thank you. Ooh, I love how you put that. And the other man was like, what is this story about the, oh, I didn't get that whole thing. It goes over their heads, which is a normal thing. The Lord said, he answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it is not given. And even another parable he throws out there to his men. For whosoever hath to him shall be given. What do you mean? If you have, you're going to be given? How do you have and you're going to be given at the same time? I thought you already had. I thought he's looking for the ones that don't have. That's not how it works. Because the Lord knows who are his. The Lord knows the ones that are getting it. And the Lord says, because you are getting it now, I'm going to continue to give more to you. It says, and he shall have more abundance. So you get it now? You're getting it? You're getting it? You're getting it? Good. I got some more for you to get. You got that? You got that? Good. I got some more for you to get. You got that? I got some more. You got that? Okay, here's a whole study on that. You got that? Okay, here's five different portions of everything I gave you times five in one. Boom. Now you're sitting there with... A king load, a bed load, a trunk, a truck full, a 16 wheeler full of knowledge about the scriptures. And all you started out with a mustard seed. It says, but whosoever had not, meaning you didn't get nothing. You didn't even get that mustard seed from him shall be taken away that even that he have. Meaning everything you thought about the Bible, you're not even going to understand that no more. Therefore, speak I unto them in parables. He said, be, and that's the reason I get. Because they seeing not, they seeing, see not. <laughs> and hearing, hear not. Neither do they understand. He's saying, look, I could tell them in many ways. They're not going to understand it. What's wrong with you? So I got to give it in parables. I give it in parables just to just to flush out the ones that ain't, ain't never going to get it anyway. And then, and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Esaias, which is Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. This is old wisdom that the Lord brought back around. This is the old wisdom, pro prophecy of Isaiah, that it was going to be fulfilled. In the latter times, that men should hear and not understand. See and not understand. Not perceive. Can't grasp it. It's still a mystery. It's still an enigma. It's still a secret to them. It's a closed book to them. It's a problem. They don't get the Bible. So it's a problem. The Bible say in Hosea 4 and 6, My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. They don't get it. They don't understand. And they will continue to be destroyed. Precepts like this, wisdom like this, as Ecclesiastes 1 or Ecclesiastes 12 goes over their head. The Lord says, Rem yes, remember now thy creator. Now I'm going to go back to the KJ. Now I'm going to go back to the KJ. And that's all I do. Man, the Lord gave us this, man. We got to, we got to love the Lord for what he did.
We got to love the Lord. Call all you me out by me a shot where he did. Oof. Um, yeah. Verse um <clears throat> verse six. Or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel of bro broken at the cistern. These are all things that you need. The cisterns carry water. A tank for some storing water. Cisterns carry water. Uh, the silver cord is attached to the golden bowl. The bowl is is where the oil is stashed so that you can have light. Remember, they didn't have no electricity, so they was hanging these different candles from the ceilings with oil in them. And all you have to do is refill the oil, light it. Now you got a lit room at the dark. Or the pitcher be broken at the fountain. What's a pitcher used for? Water. See, this is a figurative. Where's the oil go? It's in your mind. Where's the oil go? In your mind. Where's the water go? In your it's it fills your mind. Living water. Oil. I will give you oil. I will anoint you. Once those is broken, as an old as an old age, man, it and eventually you can't get it no more. Eventually this brain deteriorates, you're not gonna understand a damn thing. The young men just be gonna be spitting out the truth and you're gonna be like, ah. And you older, you're supposed to understand, but you can't, because at a certain age, there's a turning point, there's a cutoff point. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. Right? No, it's going um let me see real real quick, right? Right? So yeah, man. I mean, your mind is your mind contains the oil, and the your your mind contains the water. The Lord said, eventually it's gonna be broke, snapped. That's a head up. That's a heads up. Don't wait. Don't wait to understand this. You better get it now. And furthermore, it's figurative for the end times because there's a cut off date. Just like in your age where you can't understand no more and you can't have fun no more and you can't enjoy life no more. There's a cut off date in life in these end times where you're not going to enjoy this life no more. You're not going to get to go to movies no more. You're not going to get to go to work and enjoy the fruits of your benefits. That's why he started out by saying all is vanity. These are all meaningless. What are you talking about? I done searched out everything. I got all the riches in the world. This is the richest man of that time. The most wise man at that time. I'm even wiser than the kings who were ruled over. I have greater wisdom. Just in case you thought, well, he wasn't smart enough. Keep keep thinking, Solomon. You're going to get it. You're going to enjoy life. Just keep. People tell you that in this world. Man, just keep. Keep, man. There's a lot of. Look at your children. Look at your children. Look at your family, man. No, go to Mexico. Trust me. Go to Cancun. Everything will be okay. King Solomon knew everything. Back then, wisdom was more important than traveling and having kids and things like that. Wisdom and knowledge was the supreme. It has always been, right? And so they would say, well, keep learning, man. If you keep, he's like, look, I'm smarter than every, name a king that I'm, I'm dumber than. Name a king. I'm wiser than them all. And then he concluded, so I set out to learn everything from wisdom to madness and folly. So he didn't, some people say, well, you just know too much. You're just too smart. You got to come down with the common folk. See, over here, we just we just chill over here. We just, and then they make you make you think that the the people who are mad, the madness of the world is where life, you know, you go to a club. People love that atmosphere, that late night, the debauchery feel, that whole scheming, you know, that date life. Then you come to find out dating ain't what's dating? They ain't, that's vanity. That's that's even dating, even getting buns. Everything you thought had a meaning to it is meaningless. Getting buns is meaningless, man. Come on, man. And what are most when we get when guys when we get around each other, what are we talking about? Getting buns in the world. What's more important? Getting buns, money, uh women, money. Uh, cars, clothes, money, car, cash, hold. You know how many songs have been made just around money, cash, hold, drugs, party life? They're trying to make that seem like there's something there that you haven't. See, when you start partying, then you really going to enjoy it. Man, meaningless. Done that. Been there. Travel. All you got to do is explore the world. Get a passport. Been there. Done that. Brothers, been there, done that. Meaningless. 
when you get a few women, man, when you get more women, then you could really enjoy like been there, done that, meaningless. Well, when you have some children, ah, 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 and then you see your children, you nurture them, as as joyable as it is, meaningless. As joyable as sex is, meaningless. As joyable as traveling can ever be, it can change your mind, perspective, it's dope, you see different things, you enjoy it. I love it, I love to travel. Love getting buns, love being around my kids. Meaningless. Because you're wasting that youth. This youth is for now. You don't have that later. This little period of enjoyment is now. We're not going to have that later. What's the scripture say? Uh, see, they're wasting their youth. <clears throat> Matthew 24 and 37. But as the days of Noah were. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Hold on, what was the days of Noah like? Well, it goes on to tell you. See, this is the this is the days of Noah. See, nothing new. Ecclesiastes twelve just told us. Ecclesiastes one, Salaki just told us. History merely repeats itself in verse nine. It is all has been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. Sometimes people say here is something new, but actually it is old. Nothing is truly new. What do you mean? This is what I mean. But as in the days of Noah were, a historical moment that is past now, so also, which means just like that, Tom. Here we go again. Also, the coming of the Son of Man will be. And what has hap not happened yet out of the two? No, what happened? The coming of the Son of Man haven't, hasn't happened. So if you could go back in time and experience what it was like in the days of Noah, it would feel just like it would feel right now. Verse 38, for as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking. Last time I checked, BBQs, Dave and Busters. Fast food restaurants. All right. If you got bread, you're going to, Fili you know, where are you going? You're going to, uh, what? I forget what they call it, Philippe. You're going to Noble. Right. You're going to Mr. Child. It's probably not even top stuff anymore. But they eating and drinking. You're going to the bar. You're getting lit. They get lit. Eating and drinking is about mirth. It's not about, I need to feed my stomach. <laughs> nah, it's about mirth. It's a mirth attitude that comes with eating and drinking. This is what the time of Noah felt like right now. It's Saturday, it's Sunday, it's the weekend, it's Friday. Party. Marrying and give, giving in marriage. Hold up. It's not about, see, I need to get married, bro, because that's my, uh, that's been my girl for th um 10 years and. Um, you know, her family and my family want to come together and we want to be, it's the vibe, it's the spirit that comes with marriage. Marriage ain't, ain't nothing wrong with marriage. It's the spirit that come with marriage. Just the, all right, settle down, have a child, let's just, and now this is what I do. You talk to a married man, he's like a more, he's like the most reformed man you ever, this is what I do. And, um, I take care of all of my responsibilities and. I passed the check to my wife. She is in control of the finances, and um, we we pay our mortgage. And thankfully, uh, uh, my wedding was. These niggas are super reformed. You'd be like, oh shit. Just like the the party man is having fun, the marriage man. It sounds dope because you come into his house, everything's all orderly. We're like, that's my wife. My wife, I'd like you to meet. But that's what it was like in the days of Noah. And it's not even a it's not even a a dig on that. You wanna go go out tonight? Go out. Come on, man. Let's not be simple. You wanna go out tonight? Go out. The scripture said don't be riotous. So come on, don't make that a habit, man. Have some tact. You got a woman and you wanna lock her down. I, 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 I damn sure wouldn't 
bend down and put no ring on it, that's Saturn, Saturn or it should be. I'm not going to be walking down some aisle. She in all white. I ain't her first. What is it? What are we doing? But if you want to attach yourself to a woman and y'all work out y'all financial situation together so that y'all both can benefit, man, go for that. Man. May the Lord be with y'all both, man. And you and her be delivered on that day. But just remember, there's a vibration where if you overly into your wife, the Lord is going to cut you off too. If you overly into this club life, the Lord is going to cut you, cut you off. You know when you're putting something else before him, you think he don't know you? It says, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Everything was going. That was the last day. When Noah entered into that ark, that was it. That was the cutoff point. That was the old man. His eyes were too dark. He couldn't see no more. That was the old man whose knees was too weak. He couldn't walk no more. That was the old man. Figuratively speaking about the times we're coming to now where the grinding shall cease. There's not going to be any more work. Where the strong man shall bow. All of the elites is going to have to bow down to the Lord. They're going to get weakened because this is the, um, the ten toes. Right, the bottom part of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the interpretation there was that this was the that's NATO in the EU. This is that's NATO in the EU. We are in, in and that was made of iron and miry clay. Don't ever forget, there was a weakness in that. These men is going to fall down. There's a weakness, financial weakness coming out of these these people, and that's why they got to do all these tricky moves. Nord Stream pipeline, it all goes into it because they needed that money. They needed that gas to be able to provide because the economy just broke down. The money's all inflated. And it's a terrible judgment coming down from the Heavenly Father on our, upon our enemies right now. So until the day uh, that Noah entered into the ark, so here it go. Noah walk into that ark. They eating, they drinking, but Noah walk into that ark. The day after, did it matter? How much eating and drinking you did the day after Noah entered into that ark? Did it matter that you was married, bro? Don't never. It's meaningless. Eating and drinking, meaningless. Marrying and giving in the marriage, meaningless. Because that day that Noah entered the ark, all of that. Where was they then? They was drinking nothing but water, cause that flood took them out, and they died with they they wives that day, and he knew. Not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also be the son of the, the coming of the son of man be. You got to fear the Lord, man, these days, man. That's what King Solomon was saying. That's what he was saying about the cistern and the broken, man. You, you got to get this now because it's soon it's going to be a cutoff point. And that means there's going to be a famine of hearing the word. Scriptures in Matthew 25 talk about the wise and the foolish virgins and foolish ones and then up oil in their limbs. That means you got some oil, but you got to keep going because you might think that you got enough. You might be three years deep. Man, I'm good. Man, I understand it. I'm still young, though. I'm trying. And like I said, you want to get it off your chest? You want to go out smash on something? Don't do that, man. Deal with the escort, man. What the hell are you, what are we talking about? You want to go out to the fancy restaurants? You want to you wanna get married and entangled in a, in a relationship right now? Go for it, man. We all got our reasons why we got to do what we got to do. You a man at the end of the day. But you bet not. You bet not forget about what the Lord said. They was doing the same thing at the time of Noah, man. And knew not until the flood came. You better be un you better understand what times you in. They knew not. Even though they was warned, they knew not. Why? Because it wasn't given unto them. It was given unto you. Lord willing, this video is edifying. I didn't think I was gonna go this long, but the spirit, you know. Lord willing, this video is edifying. Till next time. Uh I'm gonna say Kohaloyim, Yahweh by Shimmy, Yahweh Shah by Shimmer Kakradash. Again, double honors to the apostles and elders, the great most on rule well over the flock, and Shalom and salutations, you brothers out here for your words of truth and sincerity. Till next time, Shalom, DTA, Bubba Ball, Shalom.